rather than the long-term care crisis, why few can afford to grow old in America. Today's event is being recorded and later today, an email will be sent to all registrants with a link to the recording. A transcript will also be available. Automated live captions can be turned on at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You are welcome to submit questions for the panel discussion at any time during the conversation. Access the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Ronnie Snyder, Vice President for Program at the John A. Hartford Foundation for introductory remarks. Thank you so much, Robin. The reporting from Jordan Rao and Reed Abelson and your colleagues has been nothing short of remarkable. Um, I have had so much outreach from friends and family who know that I work in this field but don't know about the relationship that we have together way beyond the norm. So that speaks volumes about um, the impact and the reach that you've got. So big, big thanks to you, uh, KFF Health News and to the New York Times for collaborating on this incredibly powerful and important Dying Broke series. Um, so I am Ronnie Snyder, Vice President for Program at the John A. Hartford Foundation, and we're really proud to support today's event and KFF Health News in its coverage of aging and health issues broadly. Just a couple of words about our foundation. We are a nonpartisan national philanthropy, and our mission is to improve the care of older adults. Um, we do that by working in three main areas, creating age-friendly health systems, supporting family caregivers and improving serious illness and end of life care. So you can see how important this topic is to us. And I wanna welcome and thank our audience for joining today's discussion about the financial and the emotional toll that millions of older people, people with disabilities and their family caregivers in the United States face when it comes to providing and paying for long-term care. So in statements from both Reed and Jordan, they've noted how woefully unaware people are of how much long-term care can cost. And also how the no-win choices that are facing people and their families can happen to anyone. And they really do. So this series aims to help to change that by elevating long-term care issues as social and not personal. We're seeking win-win solutions. Um, this is about all of us as we age, and it's also about our policymakers, our providers and communities working to find ways to ensure access to affordable, age-friendly, long-term services and supports. So one resource that I want to point you to is the recently released Long-Term uh, Services and Supports State Scorecard developed by AARP and co-funded by us at the John A. Hartford Foundation. Mm -hmm. That scorecard includes indicators of how states are performing along a number of different dimensions, including affordability and access. Some states are doing better than others, that's not a shock, and some states are innovating when it comes to long-term care financing. So check out uh, Washington and Hawaii as two examples of that, and um, take a look and see how your state is performing and advocate for the changes that you see in other places. A little friendly coopetition is not a bad thing. Uh, at the federal level, we've been deeply engaged with the Administration for Community level, Living on the national strategy to support family caregivers, through which over 15 federal agencies now have committed to actions in support of caregivers. One of the five goals of that national strategy specifically calls for ensuring financial security for caregivers with recommendations on a whole host of actions that should be taken. Beyond federal agencies, the national strategy also has actions for employers, for philanthropies, and for all sectors that we should take to help support caregivers financially and in a variety of other ways as well. But let's be honest, uh, the scale of the change that, we're, that we need is going to be hugely challenging. We need changes related to long-term care insurance. We need changes related to regulations on assisted living. We need a lot of changes around ownership and financing transparency, and that's just to name a few of them. So a key step is to help the public understand these issues so that they, we, can better advocate for policy changes, which is really what the series and today's conversation is all about. So just many thanks to our fantastic panelists, some of whom are bringing their 
really very personal stories to share with us. They're gonna help us understand and learn from their experiences. And thank you to all of the people in the audience for joining the conversation. We hope that you'll continue to follow the incredible aging and health journalism of KFF Health News, use our resources at the John A. Hartford Foundation. And with that, I will gratefully turn it back to Jordan. Great. Thank, thank you, Ronnie. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm Jordan Rao. I'm a senior correspondent with uh, KFF Health News. I'm one of the reporters, along with uh, Reed Abelson at the Times, of the series Dying Broke, which is a joint project of our two organizations. Uh, hopefully most of you have read it, but if you haven't, you can find it on the New York Times website and on our website, kffnews.org. And uh, and it is uh, just briefly a series that we did that was looking at long-term care uh, but with a, which is a very sprawling subject. Uh, we looked at long-term care for the elderly and we looked at it in particular and how the middle class is faring with it because uh, as we wrote in the series, it's the United States really doesn't have a system uh, like it does for Medicare and health. Uh, it doesn't have the same system for long-term care. And by that, we're talking about things like personal aids for people who need help with uh, basic activities of daily living like eating or walking and people have dementia. Um, and uh, there were a lot of components to the series. Hopefully you will read them all um, because we worked very hard on them. And uh, some of them looked at uh, the assisted living industry and how that works and costs. Some of them looked at uh, the long-term care insurance industry and how that works and costs. Uh, we, we took a little international tour into what other countries do and how they handle this uh, and how much uh, resources they put into it. Uh, spoiler alert, they tend to do a little bit more than the United States does. Um, but the, the heart of the series was really the people that Reed and I interviewed and that we portrayed in, in the, uh, the project. And so I'm, uh, we have a great panel here today. Reed Abelson is on the panel with us. Uh, she's been a reporter at the time since uh, 1995 and uh, you know, if you're a journalist, you, we, our profession, you read bylines, which means that you'll, you look for who wrote the story and, you know, there's certain people you'll always read what they wrote, no matter if you're interested in the topic or not, just because of how good they are and read is one of those people. Um, and so she's here with us. Uh, we have, um, two of the people who were, uh, profiled in the project. I'm really excited, uh, uh, to have here. One is, uh, Robert Ingenito. He is, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the suburbs of New York. And he was in a section of the project uh, that we called Vignettes or Voices. And this was, we had seven people telling their particular experiences in first person. And these were really, uh, uh, these really resonated with a lot of people. They really resonated with me. They were very powerful. And so I'm thrilled that he is here to join us. Um, and we also have Angela Jamat. And she was, uh, she's in uh, Sacramento area. Uh, another fantastic person that I was just so thrilled to get to know during this uh, process. And uh, she was uh, actually the lead of our long-term care insurance story. And I'm very excited to have her here too, because one of the things about these stories is you just take, for the actual article, you just take sort of a sliver of people, but everyone uh, that we interviewed, I mean, their stories are so much broader. And so this is really an opportunity to sort of play that out. Um, and finally, we have Ann Tomlinson on the panel. Uh, Ann is, uh, she has her own research and uh, consulting group in DC, ATI Advisory. Uh, and she's one of the first person people that I turned to when I, when we were, we started this off because she really has a lot of knowledge on the, on the ins and outs and the details of, um, of long-term care. She really knows it really well, but she also has a separate organization called Daughterhood. And this is a, I guess I'd call it a support group of, of caregivers, adult children, mostly of people who, uh, who are going through what the people in our series went through. They have an elderly parent who needs assistance, who can't live independent anymore. And she's organized these, I think they're in 20 cities or so. Um, and I talked to a bunch of the people in the groups in the course of reporting this story. And they were really wonderful. So, so Anne was just a natural uh, to to want to bring on uh, with her with her double hats uh, that share a brim. That's a very bad metaphor, but you get the idea. Um, so, in any case, that that is our panel, and I'm going to start. I'm going to uh, welcome Reed. Reed, good to see you. I haven't talked to you in like yes. 35 minutes. Exactly. Um, 
you know, read, we, we knew that this story uh, would be read, but I was really surprised really at how much it resonated. I mean, we got thousands of comments on the New York Times website. Uh, you know, the, the, the reader metrics were really off the charts. Why, why do you think it resonated so much? How did, what nerve did it hit? I think what we found is that this is a really universal experience. I mean, I literally didn't talk to anyone who either didn't have this as a personal experience or didn't know someone very closely who was going through it. And so I think the fact that this resonated so much just shows you how universal this experience is, that people are struggling to figure out long-term care. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. It was, it was amazing um, how many people uh, in our own lives, in fact, uh, we knew and, and were going through this and the editors and your colleagues and my colleagues. So uh, it really does um, hit a lot of different topics. Um, one of the things that you and I talked to when we were doing these interviews, we interviewed people over the course of, you know, well over a year, was uh, we were both surprised at um, the fact that we would contact people and they would open up very quickly about uh, their personal situations with their parents. They would open up very, sometimes share incredibly intimate details of what was going on with their families. Just, just they were really great about that. But a lot of people, the thing that they were most uncomfortable talking about was their finances, you know, and uh, what have you come to think is, is behind that? I think it's a couple of things. I think one is that the finances are just so difficult for people. I think many people really didn't have a grasp, even as they were going through it, how they were going to pay for it or what this would mean to them. And so I think there was some denial. And I think culturally people don't like to talk about money. Um, but I, I agree with you. I was really surprised at how much people did want to talk about their situation generally. I mean, they really um, were very generous about what it meant to them and the emotional toll. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I've thought about this series a bit um, about it in a way an affirming series in the sense like there are some things, some stories that just tell you something that you had no idea about, right? And then this one, I think a lot, I mean, it certainly had elements that people weren't familiar with. And we certainly, I think we, we piece together a very complicated universe that most people don't have that experience with. But, um, but it really was also something that said, you know, your experience, you're not alone. And in fact, you're not an outlier. You are the norm. And I think that's one of the things that really, um, that certainly resonated with it. Um, one of the things that you've said that you've noticed multiple times that I thought, I really thought is true is you were surprised at how resilient people are. Can you talk about what you meant by that? Sure. I mean, I, I think we approach this because there's a problem in terms of long-term care, but I was amazed at how people were able to find solutions. I mean, they really worked hard and, and they were very creative and sometimes really self-sacrificing. I mean, they moved into their old, you know, childhood bedroom. They, you know, had, you know, their mother sharing uh, a bedroom with their child. They figured out how to get a network of people to watch over someone. And so I, I was impressed by how personally people really, you know, rose to the occasion and really, I mean, we're really, I, I was really impressed um, by what people did to try and make sure that their loved ones were not neglected, you know, had the care that they needed. Yeah, I want to quickly, I forgot to mention earlier that as a reminder, you can submit questions for the panel at any time during the event using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom control panel. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Reed. And one of the things that really struck me in the conversations with people was how different it was from if you scroll through Twitter. I mean, the, just the the conversations about all everything, really, um, or any of the social media is so brittle and angry and blamey. And I was really amazed at how little sense of entitlement people had. Like, no one was like, hey, the government you know, should step in. Or, I mean, people obviously understand and, and have opinions that, you know, in some cases, government should do more. But everyone really shouldered this as like their responsibility, even when they were, I mean, we talked to people who were, you know, alienated from their parents. I mean, had barely spoken to them and got together. And they, you know, made, as you said, tremendous sacrifices. And that really 
amazed me. And, you know, I think that that comes through in this series. And I, I just found that very heartening. It would be great if there was more of that out there as opposed to the, you know, the icky mush that, that just makes you feel bad about people. But I felt it was a very, you know, you and I even talked about at one point about doing just a, almost a hero's story mm -hmm. of, of like what people had done and, and the selflessness of it for, for the relatives. And I know some people will say, well, you know, that's what they do in other countries. Um, you know, so they could get their own story, I guess. But, um, <laughs> But but it really was because I think that the image a lot of people have of the United States is we just dump everyone right we just throw them in a, in a in a nursing facility and wash our hands and and that was not really what our I think reporting experience was. No, I think you're. I mean, I I completely agree. People were incredibly committed yeah. to trying to make life better for someone. And again, I there was very. I mean people agonized over decisions. I mean, I think that that's one of the things that also really struck me. I mean, people were very thoughtful about, you know, should I think about a facility? Is, you know, mom getting enough care? You know, am I neglecting my kids? Wh whatever it was. Yeah, I think that's right. And actually, I want to pull in uh, Robert now because Robert is so epitomizes this experience. And, you know, Robert, what your your situation was a, was very, you know, to in my eyes, traumatic because your mother had you make a wish or she made you promise on her dying bed not to put your father into a facility. And um, can you and then you had a whole uh, experience during the time that we were talking um, as well as before of, you know, really, you know, going all out for your father and ultimately having to grapple with that wish versus what was best for him and best for you. So Robert, can you, you know, just sort of give us, uh, you know, that story and your journey on that? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on the panel, uh, Jordan and, and Reed. Um, so when I was about 18, 19 years old, my mother passed away from cancer. And I vividly recall, you know, when she was on her deathbed, she said to me, do not put your father in a facility. And that stuck with me. You know, it, it's, it's stuck with me. I'm now 44 years old. It's, it's still, you know, something I think about. And, you know, <clears throat> um, in the past couple of years, my father, who's now 93 years old, um, he, uh, when he was 85, he had a heart attack. And at that point, I made the decision to go from working full time to go working part time so that I could become his caregiver. Uh, for the past five years, um, he's been living in our home with me and my wife and our six year old daughter. But most recently, uh, this past August, uh, he got very sick. And in September, we made the really incredibly difficult decision to move him into an assisted living facility. Um, it was the most difficult decision that I ever had to make. Um, sorry. It's okay. I, I really wanted to keep the promise that I made to my mom. But, you know, I remember on the day that we signed the lease, um, I remember telling my wife that I just feel awful and that I felt like I was throwing in the towel. Um, but to be perfectly honest, like his level of care was becoming unsustainable for me. I wasn't getting any sleep. Um, I couldn't leave him home alone. Um, you know, we had a home health aide coming in during that, that month or so, um, but that was only during the day and it was only during weekdays. I couldn't go, um, couldn't go on outings with my with my wife and my daughter. Um, I was tied to the house, um, and if I did go out, it would only be for just like a very short amount of time, maybe to like run and do groceries so that you know I could get back home and know like he hasn't fallen, he hasn't fractured himself. Um, so it was it was just really hard, and um, you know when this was all happening. Um, as I said, it was in August, my family and I were supposed to go on vacation. And we were planning for my dad to go into what's called respite care. Uh, it was just like a two week um, stay at an assisted living facility for 
you know, just a brief amount of time so that people like me, people who are caregivers could take a respite from that care. Um, but he got sick. And, you know, the conditions that we agreed to the respite care with this facility had changed. So, you know, it was just a very difficult decision. And what ended up happening was that my wife and our daughter went on vacation and I stayed home. And it was stressful, but, you know, that was the decision that we came. And it was one of those points where I just remember thinking, like, I don't know if I can, it's a, it's a tilting, you know, balancing act that you have to make. And it was just, it was so hard. So, you know, it, that was the most recent example, I think, that, that resulted in us having to, like, finally make that decision and, and move him into, into an assisted living facility. How is he doing now? And how are you doing now? You know, I'm, I'm doing okay. And the place that he's at, like, it's, it's great. Um, he, um, he's doing well there. I try to visit him at least three times a week. Um, I always express my thanks to the staff who are there. Um, they're doing incredible work. Um, and, you know, I, having, having had my dad at home for five years, you know, and helped him with, you know, things like bathing and things like, um, you know, transferring from the bed to the commode and back again, I know what that's like. And, you know, these workers who do this, you know, day in and day out for, you know, a good, you know, number of residents at these facilities, um, they deserve our thanks. And I, I always make a point to say thank you to them whenever I'm there. And, and your dad, how is he um, adjusting or, or handling it? He's handling it okay, given the, the situation. You know, I, um, when I said this to him at the onset, um, he said he understood, you know, he, he totally realized that this was getting unsustainable for me. And, um, you know, I said to him, you know, you're not doing this for your sake, dad, you're doing this for my sake. Um, and he was okay with it. Um, you know, there are times when I visit him and he, you know, will ask me, oh, I really miss your spaghetti, Robert, or I really miss your home cooking. Um, and I tell him, you know, well, I'm going to bring you some food or I'll arrange for a day where you can come out and, you know, I'll bring you home and you can hang out with, with me, my wife and our daughter. Um, so he, you know, he has those opportunities to look forward to. Um, but it's still hard. It's still very difficult. Yeah, it's very lucky that you um, are in an area of the country that has uh, a lot of assisted living options because there are a lot that don't. Um, and, you know, and that causes a whole separate thing. The other thing I want to mention, um, and then I'm going to move on to Angela, uh, you know, uh, uh, the data show that um, the vast majority of caregivers are spouses and daughters, uh, and that I'm not taking anything away from them, but they're also, and we interviewed, you know, people like you, there are a lot of sons who are also stepping up and, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, you took, you know, you had to make some compromises with your work and your career, uh, you know, is, is, is notable and is, you know, this was, I can see that this was difficult on many levels. Um, so thank you. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, Angela, um, so uh, you, uh, your mom, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about you and your mom, and you've got a bunch of siblings who are um, all helping out with your mom uh, to take care of her. And, you know, your story and, you know, uh, the part that we had in the story was, was uh, about long-term care insurance was that your mom had bought a policy a long time ago, and uh, it only covered, as those policies often did back then, nursing home care. But uh, when it came to the point that your mom needed help, she was very adamant that she wanted to stay in her house, which is, you know, very common. So can you talk just about, about how you and your siblings have divided up your responsibilities uh, and how, how you're taking care of her now and what type of help you're, you're giving her both personally and professionally? Yes. Um, and also, too, I want to begin by saying thank you, um, Jordan and Reed. 
uh, for um, elevating our voice, our message, our, our story. Um, it has been a long journey and um, we're very grateful for those who come alongside us to help us share our story. So thank you for that. Um, I'm a try, Robert, you know, you, you struck motions inside of me that I didn't know I was, I thought I had it all in a check. <laughs> and so I, I will try to share um, as eloquently as you have, but um, yes, um, we had, um, came together as family to put together a plan in our mind to safeguard our mom in the, when she gets old. Um, my father died young uh, at 56 at, with a heart attack. And so we, the siblings, she has six children and my, my and mom was there for us all the way uh, as kids. And we we're like, we we're gonna take care of our mother knowing that, oh, if you ever get stuck with not having funds to take care of her, um, when she was old to go into a facility, if need be, we just thought, you know, that's like only if, like insurance, you know, you only want it if you have to, you don't want to use it, but if you have to, you have it and you're not uh, in a situation where you're scrambling. So we thought we were being very proactive. So we, you know, we felt very good about the level of support of our, our siblings, putting our funds together on a, a quarterly basis and paying for this insurance. And again, thinking the at the more worst option that if it had to come. Um, my mother was as strong as an ox. She was a farm girl from Alabama. And uh, physically, I, I remember um, arm wrestling her up to she was, so I was 40 and like, my God, this woman's still stronger than me. And um, I um, just, there was never in our mind that anything like this was going to happen to her. And this thing that has come upon her is this battle of dementia. I never say she has dementia. I say she's battling it um, because in my mind, no, she's going to fight this as long as she can. And because there's no one thing that happens to people with this disease. So it's like she's going to fight it through. And so with her fighting through, she wants to live and we want her to live as normal as possible. We want her to enjoy her community. She's called Grandma Jewel um, in the community because she was a part of the community. Uh, all the kids knew her. My kids went to the school by her. So all the kids around knew her. The families knew her. I mean, she's just beloved. Last year, we had a, uh, a drive-by birthday party, and it was hundreds of people that drove by. And I was shocked. I People thanked us for having such a celebration for her. Um, and it was wonderful. Light years difference of what we're in now. But the thing about it for us is like as the years start going by, 80 years old, she was like, again, sharp, moving forward. And it's amazing. She's 91 years old and it was like night and day for where she's at now. Um, so at 85, we're starting to see like, man, you know, mom's, mom's slowing down and she's not remembering. And we start trying to get help in. And, and, and then we came together as a family and said, let's get some in-home care, you know, because she's needing support like that. Well, that's when we discovered that, um, oh, you can't add a rider onto your plan now. Uh, it's too late. And we're like, wait a minute. We, well, we said, we'll just cancel and buy another one. Like if you cancel and buy another one, she's too old. We won't insure her. So we were either stuck because, because they said at 75, if you change it before 75, you could make changes. But after 75, you can't. Well, who has a crystal ball? Who knows beforehand? My mother had no signs of it at 75. So why would we know to add on? And it was so, all these little things, does anyone tell you about it? No. Does anyone send you information? Hey, 75 is coming up. You want to change your plan? No. We just lived through a journey of finding out the hard way. So here we are at 91. My mother not only is uh, battling with dementia, she's physically um, with the brain challenges. She's not even walking. So the world has changed. I, people ask me, how's Mama Jewel, Grandma Jewel doing? And I, I said, we're in a new norm. Um, to have her in her bed and have to physically lift her up, uh, watching out for bed sores and um, changing her adult diapers, um, bathing her, feeding her, is um, it's a daily journey. And um, again, I'm glad Jordan brought out about men because my brothers have been amazing. Um, all of them. 
I have five of them and they love her differently, but equally. <laughs> so I tell them all like, you're, he's got this, you got this. But, um, and not to feel bad that you don't have what the other one has. Cause some just have more strength in certain ways than others. And so all five of them, two of them actually live with her. And, but that's not enough. My, both of them work. And so we bring in caregivers and we are paying this out of pocket. So this is something we're struggling with. Um, we need more help in, and yet um, we're finally trying to physically, financially do it on our own is, is, um, it's a challenge. And I'm um, just always looking for strategies. My brothers and I always were, it's a constant, constant strategy of what to do today, how do we handle today um, and what's new, what's different going to happen tomorrow. Those are the things we're living with. Has the uh, the amount that you guys are paying for for, uh, for home care is, is substantial. Is that impacting all of your retirements? So our family, um, the, 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 the insurance plan, you know, we just said we just going to keep it going because we thought if we cancel this, then something else will happen. So we just like, even though we have no intentions of really probably using it in our minds, just like this is something that um, we're not going to cancel. In spite of the fact that it was raised 75 percent in the last two years. That's another story. I hope you guys are covering. But the <laughs> the reality is we have that the financial burden is um, supported through all of us. Um, my mother has my father's pension and my father was a wartime veteran and still we can't get any of those things. Uh, we've been trying to figure that out. Why is that such a maze? Can't get, he, my father was in the Korean uh, conflict. We can't get any benefits of that. Somehow we can't figure it out and can't get through, through the maze basically. Um, but she has a pension from his, um, his job and cause he was civil service and social security. So we have that and that's her basic living that would have sustained her. Honestly, she wasn't sick, you know, battling with this, but the added cost that no one would know without a crystal ball into the future of what your life is going to be compared to another. Um, so we financially pull in and do what we can along with her finances. Yeah, that's, um, that's a great. Thank you. Um, so, Anne, uh, uh, can you talk, can you start by just talking a bit about your, what you've noticed about what are the big challenges from, from your, you know, diverse group of people in your daughterhood group uh, and what, you know, what echoes what Robert and Angela have talked about and what other things you think uh, are, are common struggles for people who are caregiving for their elderly parents. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks for having me. And I really appreciate this series so much. Um, I just want to echo what Ronnie said that it's, I've just heard from so many people about the work that you've done here. And I just, I want to say Robert and Angela's stories are so similar to the stories that we have been hearing in our daughterhood community for five, six years. This is, you know, email after email, comment after comment in within the communities. And, um, you know, it ranges from, you know, many, many people who are not, and this is going to sound very strange when I say it, not even as fortunate as Angela and Robert to have, you know, the siblings or the resources and the ability to pay for assisted living, even the ability to pay for a long-term care insurance policy, however sort of inadequate it is to the task, the really the majority of the people that I hear from have nothing available to finance care. And so they are doing what Robert did before he had the ability to to, to, to share that burden with an assisted living community. Um, and Robert, you're feeling that emotion that was so touching, I think, to all of us. I hear that all the time. And what I just want to say to you and anybody who is feeling that way right now is that you have to do what's best for the family as a whole. Um, I think a lot of times when it's our parents, we feel like we have to do the heroic, the most heroic thing for this person that we treasure and love. And I think what 
most of the time what our parents would have said if they could have is you have to do what's good for the whole family and you did that and I really applaud that decision and so uh, and just appreciate you sharing that because I know we just hear that all the time there are these core emotions I'll just touch on for a minute in family caregiving so each individual situation is really different you know Angela's situation is different from yours Robert but underneath it all caregivers family caregivers are feeling overwhelmed they're feeling guilty and they're feeling alone. And those are the three things that are the same. And on the financing side, um, you know, you're dealing with this really difficult financial situation, no matter what. And also you have to, you have to get along with your siblings. You have to convince your parents that they do, you know, there's all of these like family dynamics, whatever's going on in your family, whatever that system is, we're going to just inject steroids into that and make it even more stressful, <laughs> you know, and then you're dealing with the navigation of the care delivery on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not just the home care, right? It's not just the bathing and the diapers, it's the medical appointments, it's the medications, it's getting this doctor to talk to this doctor, this home health company to, to get, you know, it's just, there's just an endless series of sort of navigational and management tasks. So all told, it's it's a lot. And, and Jordan, if I can, as I was listening to everyone, I did want to yeah. just take a minute and just, I'm going to switch hats for a second out of daughterhood and into ATI advisory and just share a little bit of data, because I think what your stories and what the stories of, of Jordan and Angela and Reed, it's a beautiful summary of, of what you heard tell us is what we also see in the data, which is that the vast majority of older, I'll just say older adults right now, there's certainly a lot of under age 65 individuals living with physical disabilities and developmental disabilities, but just talk about older adults for a moment. Um, if you take the, the entire, pop, you know, sort of, um, the set of people right now who who have really high levels of need. You know, they're at that point, Angela's mother, Robert's father at. Um, the vast majority of them are actually living in the community right now. They're not living in assisted living or nursing homes because of the cost. So, and because we do not have a financing system in this country to pay for it. So of those people that the vast majority, I want to say, you know, 50% are living in the community right now, only a third of those people are getting financial support or assistance from the Medicaid program to pay for the home and community-based services. The remainder are doing it all either out of pocket or it's exclusively by family caregivers. And I say that because of that remaining two thirds a half of them live under 200% of poverty. So we have a lot, a lot of older adults living in the community today without any kind of, um, you know, Medicaid assistance who cannot afford home care, assisted living, who do not have long-term care insurance policies. <laughs> Um, and, and those people are 100% reliant on family caregivers if they even have them. And if they don't, it's a very dire situation. Those are often the people most at risk of spending down into a Medicaid nursing home. So I what the reason I want to, I just want to kind of lay out the numbers because because sometimes we talk about how expensive all of this is, and it is so expensive. But the fact of the matter is that our system is actually underfunded. Like we don't have enough money sort of flowing into the system to attach to all of the people who have these needs. And as a result, people who are in Angela's situation or Robert's situation, who maybe do have some means to pay for care are dealing with like not great choices. <laughs> you know, so even like I have a colleague um, who's going through this right now, the family has the resources to pay for nursing home care out of pocket. They cannot find good quality care. And I think in part, that's because we've just starved our system. Um, if it's a system where every single family is developing their own solution, one family at a time, one household at a time, of course, we don't have an infrastructure. Of course, we don't have a system. Of course, assisted living is kind of, eh, you know, so I do think that it is this, it is this funding, like, like that huge starvation of funding in the system that is the reason why 
um, the choices that we have, even when we have money, are so inadequate to what we need. Yeah, that's that's helpful. I want to get back to uh, that issue of solutions, um, but first I want uh, Robert to uh, hop in and and Reed and Angela, you too, if you guys want to hop in at any point, uh, please please feel free to do so. Hop, walk, skip, whichever mode of transportation is best for you. To Anne's point about the incredible you know, costs that are going into assisted living or to home health care, you know, there's no question about it, right? Like that's a huge, huge piece that's missing. But, you know, I feel I can say this as, you know, a 44 year old person, there's also lost income mm. that's going on here, right? And lost income among the adult children, the spouses, whoever is the caregiver, who's taking care of the loved one instead of pursuing full-time work. Um, I feel very fortunate you know, that I have found a part-time job that pays you know, a reasonable amount of money that you know, also has given me the flexibility to do you know, all this caregiving for my father. But you know, I'm in this group of people called the sandwich generation, right? Who, yeah. uh, you know, I'm 44 and I'm not working full time. And it's, this is a big group of people who are trying to care for their loved ones. But, you know, what's the safety net that's gonna exist for me when I get to be my father's age? Um, you know, I, I just don't know. That's, that's a huge question as well. Right. Reed? Yeah, I, I do wanna emphasize, I mean, one of the things that I also saw were people who had no one. I mean, basically, right? I mean, who just sort of did without. Um, and so that, that meant they didn't leave their house. Um, they didn't really get good care. Maybe they didn't have, you know, dinner or what have you. And it's, I, I just think, you know, it's, it's such a stunning, um, I, I think that context is really important that, you know, it's so hard for even the people who are cobbling it together because very few people really had, you know, 24 seven care help. Um, and so they, they're they already, you know, sacrificing a lot, but for the, the folks who had really no, not a lot of family, not a lot of friends, I think it's just a very isolating mm -hmm. and, and difficult situation, especially if they didn't qualify for Medicaid. And so there really was no yeah. support. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great point. And we got, um, I remember in a lot of the comments to the stories, there were a couple of those. And, you know, in hindsight, like you can't do everything, but it would have been, um, it would have been great if we had also sort of profiled people like that. And, you know, because I think that, and I'm not an expert on this at all, uh, but, you know, some people have to form their own families, right? If you're, if you're on your own um, to do it. Um, but the other problem, of course, is that if you don't have kids, even if you're in a couple, like someone's at the end of it, not in the couple, right? Unless, you know, unless it's like a, you know, Shakespearean situation. So, um, so you've got, you're going to have a lot of people that are on their own. And there are, you know, our, our series, one of the things that we did, and consciously so, was we didn't, we took representative stories, right? We didn't take, I mean, the really, you know, dramatic, you know, outlying stories, but there are people that have nobody at all. And, and it could be, uh, you know, very, very devastating. Uh, Angela? And, and the reality is the sometimes a nobody just comes at living long enough. You know, um, my <laughs> girlfriend um, just buried her mom. Um, she was the last of all the siblings. So it was like all her siblings died first and she and her mother was the last. And it was almost like, you know, thank God she went for, she went first, the mother went first because her mother didn't, her mother was blind and um, battling dementia. And, and she was the last of the, she had no one else except her daughter who worked full time. And so came in every so often to check on. It was just, I mean, as, we, you have both have seen the stories are so endless and so similar um, all over and over again. But I think the biggest thing, my mother is 91. 
she came from a generation that had lots of children, you know, and and so I have three children. And so I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, let me, how, you know, we think about that. <laughs> the, the reality is that it's not necessarily, we're in a crisis as the story saying, because our society has changed and, and we are not going to have the underground economy like we used to all the time um, in general. It just, we just have changed the dynamics on our own and we must. And I do have to say that we have depleted um, the resources in a lot of ways, as Anne has mentioned, but the, also the fact that we don't pay them enough. And so the, the salary for someone who wants to take care of my mom or Robert's dad should be at a living wage. So that way they can feel honored because they may love to do the work, but they just can't afford it. And so they move on to do something different to take care of their own family. So we have a lot of dynamics of how to change this. I know Jordan, you're about to head on that direction, but I just know we, we have to start coming up with better solutions in different pockets of the space that we're in. in the yeah, space. no, 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 those are great points. Thank you. And, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the pay levels is not just uh, home health, but it's everywhere in the long-term care uh, 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 area, you know, I mean, I sort of sometimes call it the backwater of healthcare and it's, you know, uh, nursing mm -hmm. homes have the problem where they'll be paying, uh, uh, and we can debate it on a different time, whether they can pay more or not, but, uh, where they'll be paying their nurses and their certified, uh, assistants, uh, at a level where they're constantly losing them to the hospital that's nearby, if not to the McDonald's and the target, because they pay better. And that's just, you know, a huge issue, especially, I mean, these jobs are so hard. Like my job is super easy compared to, <laughs> you know, having to, you know, lift someone and bring them to the bathroom and deal with all that and deal with all the emotional issues, deal with the family and then- A family. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but Anne, I want to get back to you I want to, for everybody, right? The, the big question. So sometimes when we do a, a, a story as journalists, like the answer is like there right? It's like, oh, you know, this should be regulated tighter, or that person should be in jail right now, you know, <laughs> something like that. But this wasn't one of those type of stories. So, so I want you to talk a little bit about, like, I mean, realistically, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that the United States is not about to turn into Denmark, right? We're not going to, like, suddenly have, you know, a, a national uh, uh, social health insurance uh, program and, you know, a zillion other types of support. So, you know, given within the realm of the somewhat reasonable, I mean, what type of solutions are there out there? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I'm not, I'm not going to challenge what you did just said, but I do think we should start there just to say that the, I've been working on this for a long time. So I've been working on like my start in my career a long time ago, uh, researching and studying and modeling out, like how could we create insurance products that work uh, the way we want them to work, uh, it, you know, in a manner that would scale to the point where like, everybody would have this and we would have sort of this, this funding stream that I was talking about earlier. And after many years of working on this, the conclusion that I finally came to was that certainly the private market cannot solve this by themselves. Like it just isn't, this is just not an insurable risk that is that is possible to address through a private market. This is not car insurance. This is not even health insurance, where you have events that are happening. You know, but you buy your health insurance, you get sick, right? This is you buy long-term care insurance, and then 30 years go by, uh, and then something happens. And that thing that happens is so unpredictable. You, you don't know, to Angela's point, you know, like her mother's 91 years old. You know, my dad, I thought my dad would live to be 91 and he died fairly quickly of a serious disease when he was 82, having been, you know, zip lining two years before in Costa Rica. So this is that, it is that unpredictability that makes this appropriate for insurance, but not for a private market where some people buy it and some people don't. Because that creates a very big sort of risk pooling problem. So we do need government solutions. Um, and ideally, 
the federal government <laughs> would be the one that's solving this. And, you know, just to, just to be, and the reason why, you know, uh, Jordan, you say we're not Denmark, I mean, that the only way to pull risk through a government program is taxes or premiums. And um, that's, that is, let me just say, that is actually simple. It is a simple thing to put a program like that in place. We are not reforming a program that is existing. We are putting a new program in place. And for everybody who is listening, I just want to be super, super clear about something. Medicare does not cover this. So Medicare doesn't cover it. We'd be starting from scratch, creating a new public program that would pay for this. And we'd have to raise money for it through taxes. So it is politically incredibly difficult. But as a matter of policy, it's actually pretty simple. And we have done so much work. Papers and papers and papers and papers have been written about this. So we know what to do. We just haven't had the political will. And I think it's because I, something, Reed, that you hit on really early that I thought was so perfect was like, people look at this very much as an individual problem. It's like, they think they should have saved more or they should have bought long-term care or they should stay home and take care of their parents. Or this is, this is about my family. And in America, we're all about, you know, we're going to solve this in our family. But really, it is a collective problem <laughs> that requires a collective solution. And um, and so, in the you know, I would love to see more caregivers and families kind of rise up and make their voices heard on this issue, because I do think politicians would respond if it became a political priority. I mean, it's not an impossible thing to do. Um, in the absence of that, or as we're waiting for that to happen, and Jordan, to finally answer your question, um, I'm actually pretty optimistic and hopeful and excited about some of the things that I'm seeing at the state level right now. Uh, less than ideal because we'd like for everyone in the country to have access to the same level of support, but Washington state actually funds public insurance for its residents. So state residents are pay all paying taxes into an insurance pool so that when they need care, they actually get you know, funding to pay for care. There's some qualifiers, it's $36,500 total, which you know won't go that far. But when you think about every single person in that state having entitlement to that funding pool, that will, that will infuse the system with a lot of funding that will, will just, it will kind of raise all of the boats. Um, and other states are looking at this too. Minnesota is looking at it. I believe California is looking at it. So we've seen states and state legislatures really kind of setting up and realizing the federal government is not going to solve this problem. Medicaid is, you know, a, a liability on their books and they need to start looking at other options for paying for it. And the other thing I would just say at the state level, one of the things that we're seeing at ATI that we're doing a lot of work on is work to expand Medicaid. So you know, the way this program works is that it, you know, you have to be very, very, very functionally limited and very poor before it will pay for anything. So uh, what this means is there are a lot of people who are near poor, as I mentioned earlier, or near functional decline who are getting nothing. So that doesn't make any sense. It's like we're paying for a lot of care at the very end, which is a really expensive way to manage risks. So innovative states like Vermont, Wyoming, Washington State, again, always Washington State, are working to address this through um, Medicaid demonstration programs, which are like, you know, pilots that test new ideas. And, and I, the, the final thing I, I just want to say, and then, I, and then I, um, I'll, I'll pause, I promise, is that I, I don't want to lose the fact that the population of people who need long-term care. So people like Angela's mother, Robert's father, often also use a lot of medical care. We, we our data shows that people who have long-term care need are sometimes costing the Medicare program two or three times what you would see from somebody who doesn't have that level of need. And so there's a lot of exciting work happening in Medicare Advantage plans, happening uh, by the federal government, happening in health systems to try to address some of the long-term care needs. We have something called the Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, which combines funding for Medicare and Medicaid to create something really all-inclusive that will you know, provide a more seamless um, experience. We have a new model out of CMS called the Guide Model, 
which is called, uh, which is guiding an improved dementia experience model that this is Medicare now, basically focusing on dementia care management and improving the quality of life for people living with dementia and their family caregivers. So there's a lot of things that we can do and every health system, honestly, I think is starting to feel this pain because there are a growing number of people who have, whether it's severe dementia or functional impairment, who are sitting in hospital beds because they have no place to go and no one to take care of them. So this is, this isn't just a, I think the message is like as families, we cannot solve this problem by ourselves. We are going to have to collectively solve it and states are going to be part of the solution. Hospitals and health systems are going to be part of the solution. And, you know, uh, CMS is going to be, I think, kind of behind the scenes helping to make the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services helping to facilitate all of those solutions while we wait for Congress, hopefully, to act on something more universal and national. Thank you for your incredible optimism. <laughs> um, I, I want to quickly ask both Robert and Angela, from your experiences, are there a couple of things that you think, or from your, your broader knowledge that you've gained during all this, are there a couple of things that you think would help you or help people like you or people who have, I know that you've both gotten a lot of feedback since you've been in the times um, that just sort of pop up to your head that are things that would have made this a little bit better. Um, Angela, I want to start with you. Uh, yes, and as you said, um, I've been contacted by so many people, um, folks I haven't talked to in years since the story came out. Um, and so one was that, you know, while we talked and gave a little bit of them a little bit of tips of that or what a contract I use or whatever, but it was the emotional support that helped them readily just by talking. And so I, I definitely know that being a part of a social, uh, a group, a small group, a uh, support group, you've got to get it. You, the isolation is so emotionally hard. I, I, I I had a situation where I just felt so alone and so drained. I was, I remember driving saying, I got to get gas and I drove and I don't remember where and how I ended up at the gas station. I was sitting at a gas station with money in my, in my hand and I was sitting there for, I had been, I fell asleep. I was just there for who knows how long, but so we need help. Everyone needs to get help. So I'm part of a volunteer group called Hand in Hand and we just, just find a group that you can be a part of. But here to me, in terms of bigger picture, I look at long-term, short-term opportunities and Ann mentioned a number of things. I, I think it should be a federal, the 2024 campaign should be all over this. I mean, we should we should see everybody, every time they get up and talk on their debates, if, if they don't talk about it in their debates, scratch them off <laughs> from your mind, in my mind. It's like, it should be that high priority for each candidate. But that's the long term. Get the federal. Each state's doing great things or trying to. But if the federal government, then that's how we move it down from a holistic standpoint of the nation. But personally, I'm part of faith-based community, and I just feel like um, that's the short term. We can mobilize right now as uh, believers, as those who follow God, who knows that we have a, a, a network of folks that we can mobilize ourselves to help each other. This. This things that we do naturally as a church, um, we need to be more strategic about it. And, and I have so many ideas that I just know that the faith community needs to step up and be a part of the solution. And, and, and I know we can do it. We do it small scale, but we need to do it on a bigger scale and, and then bring the state, the government in and let them see us prove to them that we can come together. So that's my mind that the faith-based community should be more so coming, helping each other, driving people, the doctors and, and the respite. We don't have to hire, hire somebody for respite. Respite should be a part of the church. You know, they should be coming in and bringing people together and helping each other, train uh, and foster care. I mean, I, I have a lot of ideas and I love to talk to Anna and whoever else wants to get in, engaged in this because we, it can be done immediately. This, this is a fire. This is like California, we have fires. We know as soon as a fire hits the, the forest, we get hoses and put it out. And that's what we should be doing right now, putting the fire out, not waiting for government totally, because government should, I, I believe that, but we can take this and put the fire out right now in and, and small groups and then a larger group. And, it, and we can be looking at other countries and, they'll, and tell them 
look at what United States is doing. We can do it. We have the, the ability to come together. We did it in 9-11. We can do it now. And that's what we should be feeling in our hearts. You said the story has been hitting across the nation like never before. That's because it's hitting everybody. Everybody is feeling it. You gotta, you gotta run to this door. Believe it or not, if you keep living, you gotta run into this door, and hopefully, you'll run into this door healthy and take a and and go out like Elijah and just take off. But bottom line is, some of us are gonna take off and need somebody to push in a chair and push us along the way. So we need to come together, and that's that's Thank my. You. That's a, that's fantastic. Thank you, uh, uh, Robert. You have some thoughts, and then I'm gonna go to Anne, and then I'm gonna go to the questions that we've been getting. Well, I want to talk about Angela's point about, um, you know, the church and faith-based groups, but, you know, I kind of want to embed it in the, in the conversation of those of us who are caregivers, I really recommend seeking communities of intergenerational people, whether it's like through Anne's Daughterhood uh, website or through your local library or through your house of worship, um, you know, as I said, you know, I'm I'm a father, I'm a, I'm a son for my 93 year old dad, but my network of friends are mostly other parents with young kids, right? And fortunately, I have found an incredible uh, church across the street from our home that's progressive. It's in line with my own, you know, political uh, beliefs. It's open. It's affirming. It's um, it's just a place where I have connected with so many people who are going through this experience. You know, we, we, they have just such a wealth of information that we all share with each other. You know, I talk to other parishioners about stair chairs, or I'll talk to other parishioners about um, home health aids or, you know, things like this. And it just, it builds friendships and it builds empathy that, you know, I really, Want to, if I, there's one thing that I could recommend, it's just find a community of people, one that spans multiple generations through a house of worship, through a library, through, you know, even if it's an online um, discussion group where you're able to, you know, bounce ideas off of other people and get some of that, you know, help that you need. And at the very least, it's going to remind you that you're not alone, right? Like you can, you, you, you don't have to do this by yourself, that you can find the help. Robert, that is literally what we say. I mean, that is the, that is the message I feel like I'm delivering over and over and over again to our community at Daughterhood. Um, we, and, and Angela, just Yes, 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 yes. So um, it is hard sometimes for caregivers to find, it's like there's a big bridge they have to walk across to get from like that day to day, you know, like, oh, you're in it to, I'm going to set aside a time to connect with this, with other people who are in a similar situation, who can make me feel more normal, who can normalize so many of these weird experiences that, that you're having and help you feel less alone. And that is huge piece of it. And I, like, I, I always like to say, I like encourage caregivers, especially there's a big, we have this big culture in the United States of self-care. So better take care of yourself. I was like, how about other care? Like, let's take care of each other uh, through this experience, trying to do it by yourself. You know, yes, go get, if you have time and you can do yoga or take a walk, you should do it meditate, all of those things are important tools, but being in community with other people, there is no substitute for that. Um, and then I think this is my theory to Angela's point about like, this is a fire, we got to get on it, is that when we are in community together, that creates the opportunity then for us to elevate our voices as a community. So it's not left to each individual family or individual caregiver, once again, to sort of advocate or elevate to their policymakers or to their representatives what is going on on the ground level, this fire that nobody seems to see except for those of us who are in it. <laughs> so we have to elevate that fire and we can do it as, as in community with each other. And these lived experiences are critically important for policymakers to hear because it informs everything. 
you know, um, and so, you know, just, just echoing everything that you said and putting a little plug in here for daughterhood, because we do have online circles now. Thank you, COVID and Zoom. <laughs> like, like giving them an advertisement. We, uh, we do make an effort to bring people together that way, because it seems to make it easier for them. So that is terrific. So we're going to go for uh, questions now. Uh, start with a, an interesting one. I'm going to see, read how you uh, handled this one. Uh, uh, Carolyn wrote in and wrote, uh, Jordan Reed, have your personal long-term healthcare plans changed as a result of your investigation? That's not, oh boy, yeah, that's a, a good question. So I think one of the things that I learned is that denial is not <laughs> the way to go here. And um, I think the one thing that has truly changed is that I feel um, that it's important to discuss this with my family and talk about what options there are before um, you know the crisis occurs. And again, I, you know, Jordan, you, you had this experience too, where so many families are suddenly dealing with this for the first time, talking about finances and you know preferences at a crisis rather than sort of before. Yeah, yeah. K, uh, as part of our project, KFF did a poll um, for the project, and one of the their main findings was that I think fewer than half of the people uh, had had any discussions whatsoever. Um, and uh, you know, I I agree with you. I th I think what what this taught me was um, that you have to recognize that uh, th this can take many different courses and that you have to have a plan that is flexible. You can't just have a plan for nursing homes or a plan, I'm gonna just stay in my house and put in you know, an extra rubber, rubber mat and you know, a bar in the bathroom because then you get dementia. And how do you plan for dementia two years down the line? So I, I think that's, I mean, that's you know, one of the, what makes it so difficult um, to, to figure out. And so I think that you know, when I think about it, you know, uh, um, that's that's what's really affected me from from the reporting experience. That you know, you just can't be like, I'm going to do this. And then the other thing is, you people's needs change. Like we have <laughs> the number of people who said they're going to off themselves before needing um, uh, long term care uh, needs in in our comments on the stories was uh, took us a little bit by surprise. And I think some of that is is hyperbolic. I would hope uh, the data is not there that at least for for money reasons that people do that. Um, but but I think that, um, you know, people's opinions do change. And like, you're like, well, you know, I'm never gonna go into a nursing home. Well, sometimes you have to, or sometimes as in Robert's case, that's the best thing for your parents. So that's the main thing I think is that you need um, to have, it's so unknown, you need to have some flexibility to that. Um, and I'm gonna pass this on to, to the other three of you and see if you, what your experiences have affected you. And I'm also gonna ask you another question that was in the chat that I think Reed and I are not gonna answer because we're journalists is, um, have you taken out long-term care insurance? If so, why? If not, why? Oh, uh, who wants, uh, Angela, go ahead. I'll, I'll start um, because what it has done for our family, um, my insurance, uh, medical insurance gave us a, um, this chart of things to talk about. And I thought it was really helpful. It talked about insurance, um, last suggested things you want done. Do what, like, do you have things prepared? It was a nice checklist. And so my brothers and I were still working on sadly and saying some areas because I have um, uh, three brothers who are single <laughs> and no children. So three of them no, are single, no children. And it's like, dude, I may want to move to Sacramento. I said, you live too far. You know, you, he had something happen to him. And I said, you, you live in Oakland. Um, you need, and shoot, you can buy a house in Sacramento cheaper. So move here. We can take care. So we started thinking differently about aging and he moved and bought himself a house um, closer into the, in Sacramento. But we also want to know each other's finances. If you die tomorrow, I need to be able to get into your account. Somebody has to be able to open up your check account and pay for your barrel. We just 
let's talk real. So we did those kind of things with each other and and said and we has and we said let's put it all in one location so or at least one of you know where the other person's financials. So we made those kind of requirements of each other to help in aging. We also even said like what do, how do you want to you know be buried, you know, once we we wanted all those things answered because those things, we don't want to have to add the stress. We see the stress now. My mother and father, my father is a veteran, so he's at a veteran. Um, he had the benefits of that, although he had already bought the plot. So the plot's already paid for. Um, all those things we talk about, we just put it out there and talk about. And so we have clearly changed and how we know we need to prepare for each other. And as Jordan, you said, we only can guess. We realize you're not going to know. Not really. My mother's bet one of her best friends was nine years old, picked her up to, to go shopping. I mean, I'm watching her nine years old driving. My girlfriend, her mother's 95, and she hangs out with her other her sisters who are 92 and not, they're hanging out, drinking tea and cool. It's like you don't know how you're going to age. There's others who are in their 80s and are, you know, or sick or 70s or very sick. You just don't know. So we have done that as a family. Um, and I think it's been very helpful and we talk very, very candidly with each other. That's uh, that, that, uh, that point is so great. And it actually goes back to uh, what Reed and I were talking about uh, with people's reluctance to talk to us about finances that people are, and you know, I think about it just in terms of two factor authentication, like you can't even get into, I can barely get into my own bank account. So, I mean, that's, that's such a, such a good point. Uh, Robert, what about you? What are your thoughts? Oh, well, when it comes to the long-term care insurance question, uh, I'll just say it's on my to-do list. You know, um, the thing that I think I've come away from, and yeah, lots of folks have been, you know, coming up to me and saying, "Hey, I saw you in the New York Times uh, just this past weekend." I was chatting with another uh, friend of the family who we were on this discussion about um, long-term care insurance, and I was thinking about Angela's you know, experience with, uh, you know, the policy that they bought versus what, you know, the reality of the situation is. And I was saying to this friend, you know, take a close look, you know, at, at that policy. Um, you know, I, I'm, for myself, I really think about when I am with my dad and the, all of the things and all of the tasks that are on my plate. And then I, maybe say goodbye to him at his assisted living facility to go pick up my six-year-old daughter from school. And I think about what are the tasks and what are the questions and what are the, the challenges that she's going to have to face when I'm at my dad's stage. Um, that's a big question. And I know my wife is watching this video, um, you know, we're going to have to figure that out here. Um, and long-term care insurance. Uh, what's your personal view? So oh, I don't have a policy. Um, and it's on my to-do list, but it's, I don't, I don't love the options. I don't feel like it really. So, I mean, if I could buy a lifetime Policy meaning is something that would cover my the most catastrophic scenario, like you know early onset Alzheimer's, where I'm I'm you know uh, needing care for a very long period of time. I would I probably would buy that if it weren't too expensive, but that isn't really even on the market anymore. So I, I'm I don't know what I'm going to do about that. I will say just you know I'm sort of Robert very much of the same. I, I, my kids are part of blended families, et cetera. So between my stepdaughter and my two kids, there are one, two, three, four, five of us, <laughs> three kids, five of us. So, uh, so I think about that a lot. And, and, and for me, it's, it's a lot of thinking about where will we live and how can we think about paying for like a, whether it's a state and a community and a place where we can be, where a lot of things will be organized uh, to support us as far as we can possibly be supported. 
And that's about as far as I can get. Um, um, that's great. And I just uh, want to mention that one of the stories that we did uh, that's in the package is a guide to long-term care insurance. And in that, there's a very good, uh, there should be a link to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners has a really detailed, I thought it was fantastic, uh, uh, document that gives you guidance of whether you should need it, what to look for. It's a very complicated product to to purchase and um, and hasn't become easier. Uh, uh, Reed, do you have thoughts? I know that uh, on on I don't want to speak ahead of uh, out of turn for you on whether you wanted to share your your personal um, uh, uh, long insurance uh, portfolio situation. No, no, I I don't necessarily, but I but I, I would say that I'm very aware. Again, actually, this the other thing this taught me is again the inability to predict what you're going to need, um, and I think that that's one of the things that sort of to figure out a, a some sort of solution where there's as you know a lot of flexibility um and i don't know what that is per se um but i think that that's actually really really significant and i, I will just say just really quickly to something robert still challenges is that i have been very open with my children about I think one of the best gifts you can give your kids when you're in my age and older is to say, when you need to take the keys away from me, I'm giving you permission now, take the keys away. When you need to put me on a, you know, you need to find another place for me to receive care. That's what I want you to do. Like, I, I think giving your adult, your some, someday adult children risk the a freedom to make those decisions is a really nice gift that you can give them. Right. Warning, do not do this if you have a teenager at the current <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. We, a lot of jokes ensued after that. Yeah. Like, what exactly. would be done with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your long-term insurance policy cashed in for uh, Xbox Five is uh, exactly. not, not the way to go. Um, uh, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, we got a bunch of questions that I think are very good about caregivers and how you choose one. Um, and so I'm going to start with Reed. Um, you wrote a terrific story that was the fourth installment of our project uh, that was online in the Times over the weekend. It's going to be in print on uh, home care and choosing a caregiver. Uh, do you have any advice for people on how to choose someone? How important is it for someone to have a click with, um, with the parent or with the person being cared for? Um, yes, you know, the one of the most important pieces of advice I thought was actually, again, to rely on community, um, to ask people you trust and know. Um, and sometimes it's medical professionals. I mean, it could be your primary care uh, physician, you know, who's overseeing your loved one. Um, but, you know, it could be your, you know, uh, church or, or other religious institution. But I, I thought that that was actually a good place to start. I mean, uh, the, you know, the, the, we have a guide. Um, I also think not to be shy if you're going to have an agency to have them come to the home, you know, talk frankly about what your needs are and actually, you know, grill them about how they check, you know, how they um, vet their caregivers and how, you know, they do all those things. I mean, don't be shy, be really open. Again, a lot of this is communication, but, uh, you know, that's that's basically my thought, but I do think rely, really lean on, on the people you trust for recommendations. I think that that's um, really true and you have to check out references. That's great. Uh, Robert and Angela, do you guys have any from your experience, any, any advice for people? Yeah, I, you know, there's, so when it comes to the home health aid question, you know, there are kind of two roads you can follow. One road is working with an agency. And then the other road is, you know, finding, you know, hiring someone on a private basis. And I think when you're trying to figure something out, you have to also consider the risks and liabilities that are involved in the event of an accident, either to your loved one or even to the aid who's coming into your home. Um, in the end, we decided to work with an agency. And, you know, there are, you know, added costs that go into that. There are added um, you know, a minimum number of hours that you can do uh, for a minimum number of days per week. 
Um, and you know, then there's also a difference in what the price is on the weekend or on holidays. But I think if you want to consider a home health aid, you really have to also look at what are the risks that you're willing to take if you want to go that private route. Um, and I think it's also very important that you discuss what those risks are with like your spouse. You know, my wife and I, we talked about this. We decided, you know, what are we comfortable with in terms of having this person come into our home and, um, you know, also be aware of the fact that you're going to have hours of the day where a home health aide may not be doing anything. Um, they're just going to be, you know, at the bedside of this person um, and they might be on their phone, you know, during that time. And, you know, are you going to be okay with that? And I think that's that's just an important thing to think about. Great. Angela? Yeah, this is where I feel where the church community can step in right away. This is like that part of the plan that I'm talking about. It's like create a network of people who are willing and to serve in this capacity and train them. It's an it's a easy solution to help network. I'm telling you, it's I'm every day practically, I'm always talking to someone asking, do you know someone? So it's, networking is important, but it's hard, it's constant, it's constant. Because I had a caregiver, her shoulder went out. So she was our main one and now I'm like, she was gone for 10 weeks. So it's like that happened and now I'm, I'm stuck. And so I'm always in the lookout, like, you know, as a manager, always looking to keep your, your staff being uh, appropriately staffed. And that's how I feel that we're at, you know, or constantly. I, with the the volunteer group, they helped me with a contract development. And so we we made a contract and, and, and ideas exactly what I wanted. I wanted for the spiritual part of my mother's support, the physical, you know, my mother's housekeeper. So I wanted them to know, don't just do the work, help her let, at the time when she could, you know, let her be a part of it. So we detailed all those things out in our contract and then the salary, and the hours and who to call when you can't come, all those things we had to develop um, in a contract for the caregivers, but it was all privately done. I went to the company and I'm not gonna bat mouth them at this point in this conversation, but I didn't, I wasn't successful with company support. With, so I do network was my avenue and that's what we continue to do. And I think that the, those who are in that place, um, it's hard, like, you know, you're networking, who do you talk to, you're, especially if you're teleworking, you work in the house all day long, who do you telework, who do you network with? So I just think that we we have to start coming out in terms of creating organizational structure to tell people, here's a list of folks who are interested and see the profile that match. My mother's 91, she's used to types of people, you know, if you you're, if you get too familiar with, well, now she'll take anybody. But at the time, there was a point in life where she's like, who are you coming in? My, who is this coming to my house? So all these things are, as Robert knows, like you got to check all these different things about your parent, your loved one, and to develop it. But it is a networking process for most of us who are out there. For more, I've talked to in, in my experience. It Fantastic. is not a quick fix. Sorry, Jordan. I just say it is just, it is not a quick fix. It is a... It's not like, oh, we're going to just get somebody in here and that's going to help. It's a intimate relationship and it is, requires management. Do you have any one or two, um, you know, most important tips that people wouldn't think of out, off, uh, you know, if they hadn't had the experience? Uh, I know. I think Angela and Robert covered it really. Yeah. No, they got and it. Pay well. Pay well. <laughs> Overpay it, a good character. I, mean, I just, I just <laughs> think that, um, you know, if you just pay above, pay a living wage, you'll get people interested. And That's I right. know that, um, as you, Jordan said, you people at a lower wage, if you give them fifty cent more to go to a hospital, they'll they'll take off on you. So you really <laughs> do a living wage. Um, and it is it is not an easy thing. I I have to say that I've con I'm constantly asking questions, um, asking people do they know someone, and so I, that's an opportunity in our society to fix. 
I, I just flip, flipping to policy. Sorry, Jared. I just flipped to okay, policy for a second. Go. I just Go. we just have to have some infrastructure for this. Like this is not. We, we've got Angela and Robert, so incredibly resourceful, smart people figuring this out. Like if we really are going to keep people in their homes using home care aids, there has to be more of an infrastructure for us to bring aids to this industry, train them, pay them, and, and give people access to them. It, otherwise, we're really just how we're all out there in the Wild West. No, fantastic. I, uh, uh, I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes. Just... Uh, but just so we all know, we're we're going to wrap up in the next couple of minutes um, due to time constraints and possible issues with fire alarms. I don't know. No, anyway, we're, we're almost done. So uh, Robert, go ahead. For all of the policymakers and like congressional staffers who are watching this, I just want to say like, yes, your job is cut out for you, right? We need more comprehensive, a more much more comprehensive system. But I also feel like there needs to be a better, better knowledge source in place so that when folks are in these crisis situations and we're forced to have to make decisions that are so monumental, we're not making those decisions under the stress of that moment, right? Like I had to figure out on the fly what the difference was between a CCRC and an FFSCCRC. That's ridiculous, right? Like while I'm having to transfer my father okay. from the bed to the commode, Amen. I to understand like what the, what on earth is the <laughs> difference between assisted living facilities? Like it's, it's unheard of, it's right? And I think there just needs to be a knowledge source in place so that those, those of us who are gonna try to start figuring out what to do, we are educated and we know what to do when these crisis moments come up. That's a, that is so well said, and that's a great place to end. I want to thank everybody, uh, Reed, Anne, Angela, Robert. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, I'm supposed to say that a report, a recording will be posted online later today, and all registrants will be sent an email. Um, so uh, that will be one more email that you will get, but uh, this will be <laughs> floating around. And um, I just want to say... Um, that uh, I think I could speak for Reed and me that really the most satisfying part of this uh, project was talking to people like Angela and uh, and Robert. Uh, a lot of times we ha we just sort of drop into people's lives, parachute in for a quick story, but we stayed with people. We had several people whose parents passed while during the reporting stage. And, and we really, I think, uh, I hope, I hope readers will find that the series is, is more full because of that. Um, but anyway, thank everybody. Uh, all of the people who attended. Uh, we're going to put up a uh, card. There it is. Um, if you have a story idea or if you have a tip, uh, this is my email. This is Reed's email. Uh, and please feel free. Please send us something. It's in confidence. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are still uh, working on this subject and other subjects. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to uh, KFF. And I uh, hope everyone has a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.